Hi online family, Maddie here. We're here at church getting ready for Sunday and I'm so excited that you're a part of this message. We're a church that loves God, loves people and loves life. And I'm praying that this message is gonna speak to you, it's gonna inspire you and uplift you in your journey in life. So why don't you go ahead and share it with someone in your world and let's be all a part of what God is doing together. I love the house of God. It's awesome. All right, Joshua chapter one. Stop fooling around. Let's get into the Word of God here. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, He said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all his people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised To Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, listen to it, shall be your territory. Everybody say territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land, everybody say land, Land. that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Can I just stop there and say for a second, if it's good enough for Joshua to read and be in God's Word, can I just encourage you, it's good enough for us. And we need to be people that meditate on the Word of God every day. We need to be people that live according to, you can't live according to the Word of God. You can't be a biblical person unless you read God's Word more than just on Sunday. Just is what it is. Sorry. We'll keep going. Uh, where was I? For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. Listen to this. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go. Come on, let's pray. Lord, we love you. Thank you for your word. God, thank you so much that it, it's not like any other book. Father, we thank you that as we read the pages of our Bibles, the pages of our Bible read us and help us and show us. And God, we thank you that every single word in here is preordained and anointed by you for us. So God, we thank you for that today, Lord. We pray that this series would be impactful, that we would look to the life and leadership of Joshua and we would be inspired, Lord, to live and to lead like Joshua did, to understand the power of God working through our lives God, we thank you for it, Lord. We pray for Colonial Kids, for the generations that are soaking up the Word as well. Today, on a Sunday, Lord, we thank you for what you're doing in their lives as well. And a faith-filled congregation said, Amen. Amen. Verse 2 says, how it begins, Moses, my servant, is dead. What a great way to start. Sounds a bit negative, doesn't it? A little bit on the down low, low point. He says, Moses is dead. Now, therefore, arise. Go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. You know there's a land of promise for you? Do you know that God has a land of promise for you? God has a land of promise for me and He's a land of promise for you online. You have a land of promise that the Lord God Almighty wants to give to you. It's a place that's not filled with literal milk and honey today. Although that would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Like just stop for a second, just go to a town you've never been to and just be like, man, milk, honey, smells good, looks sweet. That would be awesome. But it's not literal for us. But today in our new covenant context, it's filled with the peace of God, the blessing of God and the will of God through your purpose. It's His land for you. You have a specific land of purpose, land of promise 
that God has given you. Verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. The Lord directs your steps and he knows what is good for you. He knows the land of promise he has for you. He says, just as I promised Moses from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates and all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. In other words, it's a land of promise and a land of inheritance and a land of possession. And you're called and I'm called to inherit that land. I'm not talking about natural land. I'm talking about spiritual land. It's not a natural possession, although there will be things in life that God causes you to naturally possess. But greater than that is the spiritual possession that God has for you. It's a supernatural possession. But as we're going to learn in this series, as we study this incredible book in our Bibles, it's not going to be straightforward. It wasn't for Joshua. It wasn't for the people of God, Israel. And it won't be for you and for me. Along the way, there's going to be fights that, listen to me, friend, we must have to win the war that God has called us to win, which for you and for me is the good fight of faith. I love the scripture that says, through faith and patience, we inherit the promises of God. Along the way, there's going to be some battles. Along the way, there's going to be some things you've got to go through. Along the way, there's going to be some times when you've got to go toe-to-toe with the enemy and the evil one. But God has caused you to win. And God has caused you to be victorious. You ever felt along the journey of life, there have been some opposing forces? You ever felt on the journey of life, there's been some attacks that have kind of come your way? Some resistance in the spirit realm. I'm not talking about a long line at Chick-fil-A, by the way. (laughs) Although that sometimes feels like a spiritual attack. Especially when you've got three kids screaming at you from the back seat. (laughs) Not today, devil. Not today. (laughs) Not talking about something like that. I'm talking about when you just feel like there's an attack, there's an opposing force, there's something trying to get you down. You know that's actually a good thing? It's actually a good thing. I'm going to explain why, but the thing about it is if you feel a spiritual attack, if you feel a force coming against you, if you feel as you're trying to take territory in life, as you're trying to possess and inherit some place that God has for you, and you feel a resisting force, you're actually on the right track. I'd love it if you could write this down. It's just going to be a big theme in this series. Okay, you ready? Here it is. If I'm under attack, I'm right on track. If I'm under attack, it means I'm right on track. Let me say it a different way. If you're taking ground from someone, that means someone is losing that ground. And he doesn't like it. And there may be spiritual attacks. Come on, is this speaking to anyone this morning already? Because there's a land of promise for us all. And the land is the overcoming life that God wants us to have in Christ Jesus. So as we study even the book of Joshua together, we'll see this land of promise talked about and won. And God has it for you. And maybe you're in here today and this is just going to be a series of hope. This is just going to be a series of faith because you've been, maybe it's because of what we've been through as a globe in the last couple of years, or if maybe it's just in a, a season you're in where you feel like, like you're a little bit down, you feel like, man, there's not a lot of hope. This is going to be a message and a series of hope because God has promise ahead for you. He has good things ahead for you. He has a supernatural, spiritual land flowing of His blessing for you. So what's this supernatural, spiritual land of promise look like? Okay, I wrote a few words down. You might just want to write these down. What does the land look like for me as I enter into the land of promise? Here we go. It's a land of blessing. It's a land of rest. It's a land of favor, breakthrough, overcoming. It's a land of accomplishment. It's a land of provision, resource. It's a land of success. Grace, love, kindness, and mercy. That's an, that, they are just words to define, words to, to put color around this land of promise that God has got for you and for me. But to inherit and to take possession of this land, it's going to take a few things, okay? And I've also got some words I want you to write down. It's going to take a few things. Here we go. It's going to take faith. 
to inherit your land of promise. Next one. It's going to take obedience. Oh, that's fun. Preach about that. But it's true. If you study the book of Joshua, it's faith married with obedience. Faith and obedience. What are some other things that is required to inherit and take possession? It's going to take trust. It's going to take equipping. It's going to take stewardship. It's going to take preparation. It's going to take sanctification, i.e. holiness. You know, God has called you to live a holy life. Again, popular preaching, preacher. But sanctification is part of this whole deal. And we'll see it in the book of Joshua. There are moments before cities are won, before strongholds come down. And God says, sanctify yourself. Set yourself apart. When When you live holy as a believer, you're set apart for a reason. God is using you. To take ground, sanctification, leadership, growth, other, other things that's going to take steadfast commitment to Jesus Christ and his purpose and his plan. That's why God said directly to Joshua in verse 7, don't turn. I love that. He says, don't turn. Don't turn to the right or to the left. All right, part one of this series is the title. You ready? Here it is. Called to fight. Called to fight. So if there's a land of promise for me, it means it's going to involve a fight. You can see so much of my own personal journey, and I believe you'll see so much of your own personal journey in the life and leadership and journey we see in Joshua. And this series we've called War because it is a war out there. It is a war outside, and it's going on for you and for me. And we see this in the stories, in the cities, in the land, and the possession, and the breakthrough, and the miracles that we see in the, the journey of the book of Joshua for God's people. The stories matter. You know, the Bible has so many amazing stories. You know why there's so many stories in the Bible, both Old Testament and New? There's a reason. It's because stories are recorded to give encouragement, to equip us, to understand some things, to give us revelation. But the ultimate reason of stories in the Bible is to glorify and magnify God's power in our lives. Because if it was all about you, it would be powerless. But if it's all about God, it's filled with His power. It's filled with His glory. It's filled with His majesty. So what I want to do real quick is I just want to take us on a little bit of a journey before we get to my two points, okay? We're going to set this series up properly. So we're going to go to Bible college for just a moment. Is that okay? We're going to go to Bible college. So put your student hat on. Maybe you haven't been in college for years. This is your opportunity to get back in college. So we're going into a lecture right now in Bible college. Here we go. When it comes to spiritual battles, spiritual battles are real. And maybe you're a new believer today and you're like, well, I didn't know that. So what does that mean? Well, you're going to learn about it because here we see natural battles, but they mirror a supernatural battle. Spiritual battles are a real thing, and what we fight today is a spiritual enemy. I want to give you two New Testament verses that show us this. Paul says it to the church. He says it to believers, new believers as well. In Ephesians 6 and verse 12, he says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Look at this. Against the spiritual forces. There it is. The spiritual forces of evil... In the heavenly places. Can I just encourage you that they are still around today? They're still, they're still opposing the people of God. They are still trying to come against the plan of God today, and we're in the middle of the war. Let me read it to you in the message. It says, and that, that about rats, rat, <laughs> wraps it up. God is strong, and He wants you to be strong. So take everything the Master has set out for you, well made weapons of the best materials. And put them to use so you'll be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. See, it's a supernatural spiritual battle we fight today. For the weapons of our warfare, there's the word warfare, are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy 
strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Why are we talking about spiritual warfare? Because this is the theme of the book of Joshua. And as we engage the Holy Spirit, as we walk according to the Word of God, as we walk with the power of the Spirit in us, this is what happens, is we're actually able to discern spiritual battles in the spirit realm. i got a thought for you, I just wrote this down. But what your eyes can't see, your spirit man can discern. So what your eyes necessarily can't see in the natural happening, your spirit can discern exactly what's going on. And the Word of God and the Holy Spirit that comes alongside, which is the Holy Spirit's role in our lives, helps us discern and understand what's going on. There is a clear link in Scripture between what's happening in the natural and what we feel is going on in the supernatural. So if your eyes can't see it, your spirit can discern it. Spiritual warfare is happening all around us. So what I want to do is just want to take us for a moment to to just some foundation stuff about the book of Joshua. You ready? Here we go. Fun facts about the book of Joshua. Joshua in John, uh, Joshua chapter 1, he's 85 years of age in Joshua chapter 1. Wow. I, don't know about, I don't know what you're going to be doing at 85. Like, I can't wait to hang out with Joshua in heaven. Yeah. Like, I'm going to be knocking on the door of his house. I'm not sure if he'll answer. Probably be in the back patio hanging out with Moses. But I'm going to be like, dude, 85? That's when you got started? He was 85 years old by the time we read Joshua chapter 1. He'd lived a lot of life before this point. This is Joshua, by the way, is not Joshua's biography. It's just part of his life. There's a whole lot we read and we understand about Joshua's journey before he's referenced in Exodus, he's referenced in Numbers and Deuteronomy. There are several things about Joshua that we have to understand that that are very, very important as we begin to study this book. Okay, we're going to be doing devotionals throughout the month of August. It's going to be awesome. I believe God's going to show up. He's going to show you amazing things. But here's a few key things about Joshua. Moses actually changed his name to Joshua. It's in Numbers 13 and verse 16. And this is where he's sending out the 12 to spy out the land. And if you don't, if you're not reading closely, you won't see this. Because you just think, oh, well, he just changed his name. But it says this in verse 16. There were na- these were the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy the land. And Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. It's a name change. You'd be like, well, you know, is that significant? It's really significant. Because this was a prophetic change of name, a prophetic message that was sent over Joshua's life. Hoshea, that word means salvation and rescue. That's what Hoshea means. And, and Moses says, your name now is Joshua. And that means Yahweh is salvation. That means the Lord is salvation. So it went from being salvation to God is salvation. It was a prophetic name change. And can I just encourage you, there'll be times when words are spoken over you that line up with your purpose and what God has, ha- has for you. So he's given a name. He's given a new name. And it was prophetic in nature that included his, in his purpose. Something else about him is he was born in Egypt. He was born into slavery. There were, whole, there were terrible conditions. It was a whole situation. It was a whole mentality. It was a whole thing. He was born into a situation and these people had been there for 400 years. So yeah, I feel like he probably needed a prophetic word at that point. <laughs> He probably needed to hear the voice of the Lord spoken over him and his purpose. So that was something about him. He was given a new name. Here's something else. He had a heritage that was really interesting. He was born into prophetic destiny. Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim. And Ephraim means fruitful. It was the most populous tribe. They had the best land, the most fruitful farms, the flat land where the stuff grew really well. And there were many signs that this was one of the most blessed tribes. But Ephraim as well was a lead tribe. And what we see is we see this lead tribe, actually, um, his grandfather and his father were at the very front of all those that marched through the wilderness. These, this was Joshua's father and grandfather. So he was part of a lead tribe. He was part of a fruitful group of people. Joshua was from the lead family of the lead tribe. 
He was born into leadership. Something about him is he was also a servant. He didn't rest on the laurels of his grandfather or his father. He didn't walk around saying, you know, I'm, I'm the man because, you know, I'm part of the leaders and I've got the best situation and I've come from this pedigree and this heritage. No, he was actually an incredible servant. He was an incredible servant-hearted person. He didn't rest on his laurels and he resisted the temptation to rest on his family's name. Like I said before, he was also born into Egypt, terrible conditions. But why is that important? It's because he didn't let a slave mentality stop him from becoming a servant for God. And for, for some of you in here today, it's going to take a little bit of a change of thinking for you to enter into your land of promise. It's going to change maybe... You taking a few of those thoughts, you know what I'm saying? And say, hey, I'm going to take this thought and I'm going to make it obey Jesus. I'm going to take this thought of negativity that I'm trying to tell my soul and I need to take it right now and I'm going to submit it to Jesus. Here's the truth. Sometimes we can't control what comes in here, but we can do something between here and here, which is to put it to the submission of Jesus Christ. And it's a change of mentality. And I love that we see that in Joshua's life. He didn't let a mentality stop him from becoming a servant. Something else about Joshua, he already knew victory. He'd actually already led a victory before we we read about him in Joshua. It's in Exodus 17 and verse 8, verse Amalek. It's the story of Moses and Aaron and her on the hill and they're lifting up his arms. And when they lift up his arms, they're winning. And when his arms go down, they're losing. It was Joshua who actually led that battle. Moses saw leadership on his life. Moses saw him as an outstanding leader and God gave him a foretaste of victory that he would experience later in his life. Something else about Joshua, this is pretty cool, he was at Sinai. He was there. It's in Exodus 24 and verse 12. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there that I may give you tablets of stone with the law and the command which I've given, which I've written for their instruction. Look at this, verse 13. So Moses rose with his assistant, Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. I mean, can we just stop for a second? Could you imagine? You're right there with Moses. God says to Moses, come on up, I'm going to give you the law, which became the fabric of society for the people. This incredible exchange between God and man, between God and Moses, and Moses is like, yo, Joshua, let's go. We're going to go. We're going to go. Could you imagine? He was at Sinai. Something else about Joshua is he was always in the house of God. He was in the tabernacle. This is Exodus 33 and verse 11. This is when Moses talked face to face with God. Joshua was there. Verse 11, inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Look at this. Afterward, Moses would then return to camp, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. Again, could you imagine? You got Moses talking face to face with God and you are probably meters away. And then, then after the conversations happened, you know, after the, 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 the talks happened, could you imagine the presence of God, the tangible presence of God in that moment? And Moses is like, all right, I'm going to head back to camp. I'm going to go have a sleep, maybe take a nap, have a snack. Joshua just stays in the presence of God. Can I encourage you? There's nothing more powerful than being in the presence of God. There is nothing more significant Then you deciding, God, I'm going to make your house a priority. I'm going to make what you're building a priority. I'm making a commitment in my life, a priority in my life to soak in the presence of God, to be in worship, to be whatever's happening at church. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be a part of it, God. I want everything that you've got. Joshua made it a priority to be in God's house. He was in the tabernacle. He was also one of the 12 spies. Numbers 13, he was chosen. Of the 12, but he was actually the two of the 12 that had the faith, which I think is interesting. But the reason that I bring that up is because if he was part of the 12 spies, it meant that he was like a special forces type of guy. And I'm pretty pumped about that. You know, like he's the type of guy who could go get stuff done, if you know what I mean. Like he was the real deal. He was a warrior. He was a leader. He knew how to fight. He knew how to conquer. He knew how to go after stuff. His calling was incredible, but it all begins right here, 
Joshua chapter 1. Okay, so Bible college is over. We're ready to get into the message. Here we go. Point number one, beginning the series with this first point. Number one, write it down. There is a war going on. The title of the series is War for a reason, because there's a war that's going on. There is a war going on right now. I'm not talking about a natural war. I'm talking about a spiritual war. I wonder if you're aware that there's a war going on. You know what happens when you say yes to Jesus? Is you get automatically enlisted into the war of God. And you might be in here today and you probably never heard that if you're a new Christian. And I'm just, I'm, I'm so happy to be saying that to you today. Because sometimes we live in a world, especially in our Western type of Christianity, and I'm not knocking it for a moment, I'm grateful for it. But it's easy for us to grow comfortable and forget there's actually a war going on. And I can be guilty of this myself. But there's a war that's going on beyond these walls. There's a war that's going on beyond this place right here in this space where we come together and unify and get around God and hear from Him and get nourished to go out there and fight a war. And the war is for the souls of the people who do not know God yet. Make no mistake, the purpose of your life is to say yes to Jesus, to connect with God, and then go out onto the battlefield for Him, spiritually speaking. Joshua was stepping into a war. He didn't know necessarily all that was going to happen. I don't think God specifically said, okay, here we go. 31 kings, 31 cities, whole lot of pain, whole lot of struggle. You're probably going to hate it at times. He didn't say that. He said, be strong and be courageous. God takes care of all that. All we need to do is have faith and understand we're in a war. Joshua was stepping into a war. You're stepping into a war, but the enemy is real and he's present. Listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. He said, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy... That's to you and to me. Your enemy. My enemy. We have an enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith. Battle time. Because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. This is a change in mentality. This is understanding there's a war going on. Sometimes we need to think about this when it comes to our marriages. Sometimes we need to think about this when it comes to our kids. Come on, I'm preaching this morning. Sometimes we need to remember there's a war going on. There's an enemy that's roaring around trying to take out my kids. Not today. Not ever. In Jesus' name. There is a war going on. You know there's a war going on for your friends? Do you know there's a war going on for the people that you love? Do you know there's a war going on? Even greater than that for the people that God loves. You have an enemy and he's not lying down and saying, yeah, cool, go for it. Have at it, you know. Let me just move out of the way for you. It's the opposite. He doesn't give up territory without a fight. You know, there's a little bit of a difference between knowing you're in a fight and having a little fight in you. And I really believe the church of the Lord Jesus Christ at this time, right now, needs to rise up with a little fight and understand the enemy's not taking this ground anymore. This is our territory. This is our possession. Those people that don't know God yet, they're coming into the kingdom of God and we're going to go get it. There's a war over their souls. That's why God was so specific to Joshua. Verse 9, he says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Don't be frightened and don't be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Don't let the enemy tell you that there's places that you go that God doesn't go with you. He goes everywhere with you. Wherever you go, God is with you. And as you step into the war, Like God said to Joshua multiple times, he's saying to you and to me today, listen to me, friend, he's saying, be strong. Why? Because you're going to need your strength. He says, be courageous because it's going to take some courage to do this. He said, don't be frightened because no weapon formed against you is going to prosper. He says, don't be dismayed, don't be discouraged, even when there's moments that seem like there's defeat, moments that seems like you're weak. It says, don't be dismayed. Why? Because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. 
So how do you know you're in a war? Well, the truth is, while you're on this earth, while you're drawing breath as a Christian, you're engaged in a war. It's happening. It's going on. But the war is actually called by the Apostle Paul, the ministry of reconciliation. It's in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. This is how the Apostle Paul describes the war that's going on. You ready? And all of this is a gift from God. (laughs) Awesome, Apostle Paul. That's amazing. We're in a war and you're calling it a gift. Yeah. It's a shift in mentality. It's a shift in thinking. It's a privilege and an honor to go to war for the king. And that's the truth this morning. It's a privilege and it's an honor. All of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ and has given us, look at this, this task of reconciling people to him. If you're looking for purpose today, you just found it. You could spend your whole life devoted to this one thing and you'll live the most fulfilled life ever. Because in this war, we've been given the task of reconciling people to him. You know, this is why Colonial Church exists. Colonial Church does not exist so that we all have a nice thing for us to go to. Spoiler alert, I'm so sorry if that's what you thought this was. But I did not leave what I used to do. Jill and I we not, did not leave the things that we used to do to start this work called Colonial Church so we could just be comfortable. We started it so we could go onto the battlefield, so we could go into the war that God has for us, so we could go as far as we could in the life that God has given us to reconcile as many people to the King that we have, Jesus. Can I get an amen? Paul says, this is the task. This is what we're doing. And God says, the battles will come. Because you will find yourself fighting battles if you join this war. What do they look like? Well, have you ever felt like sometimes it just feels hard to overcome some things? It's a spiritual battle. You ever feel like there's a sense of pushback at times? It's a spiritual battle. You ever find like it's not always easy spiritually to walk with God? You feel like something's come between you and God? Can I just encourage you? It's a spiritual battle. Sometimes it feels like sin's creeping in and sin's always there. That's a spiritual battle. Feel like you're always trying to push through certain things. Could be a spiritual battle. Feel like there's opposition building up in your life to things that you know is the purpose of God and the calling of God. That's a spiritual battle. Here's a good one. You ever feel like you've been ambushed? That's a spiritual battle. And we're going to see this in the book of Joshua as well. There's a war going on. That's point number one. But here's the good news. Point number two. You ready? We are all called to conquer. So yes, there's a war. That means battles. But the good news is we're all called to conquer now. Joshua was the specific leader. Joshua was, the one, Joshua was the one that God had chosen, but through Christ Jesus, through the grace that we now have in the New Testament, New Covenant time, we are all called to be conquerors in Jesus' name. We're all called. God has now placed the same faith He put in Joshua, He's put in you. So when you read the pages of the book of Joshua, you should just insert yourself into that story. And I pray as we go along, you're going to begin to see the moments where you're like, man, I can see Jesus here. I can see the Holy Spirit here. I can see reconciliation here. I can see forgiveness. I can see the grace of God here, but I can also see me here. Because we are all called to conquer. I feel like I'm preaching so good this morning. Is this just me? No, it's not me. It's God. But we're all called to conquer. And I want to speak these three things over you today. You're called to overcome. And you might be in here today and you're like, man, it's just been rough lately. You're called to overcome. And you might feel like your circumstances are saying different things. You might feel like, oh, it's just like really hard right now. doesn't matter. You're called to overcome. You're called to find success. Do you know that you're actually called in life to be successful? Not for your glory, but for God's glory. And let's not misconstrue things like we don't do prosperity gospel stuff here. That's not what we're about. We're about grace. 
We're about the Holy Spirit. But let me tell you right now, God wants you to be successful to display His glory, to display His goodness. So you're called to be successful. And the other thing you, that I wanted to say as well was you're destined for victory. You're called to be a conqueror in this life, in this war. How do I know this? Romans chapter 8. Team, you can come back up. And I want to connect this, each, each message to New Testament truth, New Testament calling for all of us. But in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul uses the language of conquest. He uses the language of war to connect us to this story that we see in Joshua, all this overcoming, all of this purpose, all of this success, all of this breakthrough. He uses all of that and he sums it up for all of us who are Christ followers. This Romans 8 verse 35 it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And he says this, as it is written, for your sake we have been killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Look at what verse 37 says. No. <laughs> I love it. Paul says no. Sometimes we just got to have a good old fashioned no when it comes to the devil. And he's trying to get into my life. Some of you over your families, you say, need to say no. When it comes to your kids, No. When it comes to your marriage, devil, no. You stay away from my family. You stay away from my kids. You stay away from my people in Jesus' name. You're not welcome here. Some of you need to do a Jericho march around your house. Let him know. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels or rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus our Lord. He says, yeah, where there's struggle, where there's been separation, where there's been a disturbance for the people of God, where there's been death and destruction. And he says, no. He says, it's not like that. This is what it's like. He says, you are more than conquerors. You know, if it said in there that we were just conquerors, then that would be one thing. But you know, it says more for a reason. He says, we're more than conquerors. So he lends from the conquest language of Joshua and then on this side of the cross and the victory in Jesus, it says you're more than conquerors. And this is why. Because we share now in the victory spoils of what Jesus has done. Come on, church. We now share in all the spoils. What does that mean? It means as you conquer your cities, as you go forward towards your land of promise, as you go from one step to the next step to the next step, this is what happens. You're more than a conqueror now, so you just get better and you just get better in Christ. Things get better. The grace of God seems better and better and better. You're more than a conqueror. I love what this one study it said. It says, we have conquered the conqueror with simply a glance of our worshipping eyes because we've won the heart of God. You know, through Christ Jesus, when you worship God, you've won His heart. And the Greek word for conquerors here is hyper nikeo, the Greek word for hyper victory. It says, God's love and grace has made us hyper victories Empowered to be unrivaled, more than a match for any foe, more than conquerors. So whatever situation you face, whatever you go through in life, what does that mean? It means not only can, are you a match for that foe, not only are you a match and you have what it takes to overcome, but you can overcome greater things. You can overcome bigger things. Whatever the mountain looks like, you can tell that mountain you need to get out of the way because I have Christ on my side. I have God's love in my heart. I have the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ rising up on the inside of me. Come on, would you stand? God, we thank you today that you've called us to be more than a conqueror more than a victor. 
So Father, I just thank you as we look to this story, we ultimately, we see you, God. We see the victory of Jesus. We see the cross and the empty tomb, God. So Father, we thank you today, Lord, that we have the grace we need because we have Jesus. Amen. Come on, church, let's lift our hands right now. Well, I hope that message inspired and encouraged you. Well, before we finish, I would just love to ask you one question. The question is this, have you ever said yes to Jesus? I'm not talking about knowing of Him. See, that's education. I'm talking about knowing Him personally. That's a relationship. Friend, I wonder if you've ever said yes to Jesus, opened up the doors of your heart, surrendered ownership of your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that if we believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord and we confess with our mouths that God raised Him from the dead, Romans says that we will be saved. I wonder if you've ever made that choice. I wonder if you've ever said yes to Him. I would love the honor and the privilege of leading you in a prayer right now, right where you're at, into a new life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ. It's as simple as praying this prayer. And if you're ready to make that choice, why don't you just pray this prayer right now with me? Say, Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you died for me. And thank you that you rose again so that I could have life. Forgive me of my sins, of all the things I've done wrong. I make a choice today to follow you, Jesus, to be a child of God for the rest of my days. Amen. Amen. We are so excited. If you pray that prayer, you're saved. We believe you're on your way to heaven. But what we'd love to do is give you a free gift from our church. It's a New Believers Bible. And if you pray that prayer, we would love for you to reach out to us at colonialchurch.life and we will send you this free gift of a new Bible to you. We are so excited as you take this first step in your new journey of faith. God bless you, church, and we'll see you next week.